Okay. Um, thank you everyone for coming to this event. Uh, this is the second event in the transnational and situated research seminar series hosted by me, uh, Dong Lai Shi, at the uh, School of Humanities at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Uh, the talk title today uh, is Narrative, Imagina Imagination, and Migration in the Southern Hemisphere, an interview with Professor Alec Burma. Um, so I have invited uh, Professor Burma to talk about this very um, relevant question uh, that is truly transnational, um, as we emphasize in the title of this series. Um, professor Alika Burma is Professor of World Literature in English and Director of the Oxford Center for Life Writing at the University of Oxford. Uh, we've known each other for many, many years, and she used to be <laughs> one of my dear tutors uh, in Oxford, uh, really guided me through uh, my journey in post-colonial studies and later research on race and world literature. Uh, she previously served as Director of the Oxford Center uh, the Oxford Research Center in the Humanities, and she was a Rhodes Scholar from South Africa. She is a founding figure in the field of postcolonial studies and internationally known for her research in Anglophone literature of empire and anti-empire. She is a fellow of the English Academy of the Royal Society of Literature and the Royal Historical Society. She is the author of numerous academic books, um, including postcolonial poetics. Indian Arrivals, Networks of British Empire, Nelson Mandela, a very short introduction, and so on. <laughs> the list goes on. I will just um, list the ones, uh, most recent ones. Um, but apart from that, most relevant to um, our conversation today, she is also an acclaimed novelist and short story writer. She, her fiction includes uh, the collection To the Volcano and Other Stories, The Shouting in the Dark, Shamila and other portraits, Now Baby, Bloodlines. Uh, the last two very um, poignantly <laughs> will be translated into Chinese and will be published next year. Um, so we really very much look forward to that. Um, and uh, some housekeeping rules. Um, so today we have we will have this interview and uh, Professor Burma will start with uh, several uh, key points uh, by showing a PowerPoint and so we can kick uh, start the conversation with something, uh, and then the interview with me will run for around an hour. Uh, and after that, we will have half an hour for Q and A with the audience. And if you like to ask your question, maybe you can type that into the chat box, and I will uh, pick the question. And maybe you can um, um, ask. I will ask you to unmute if you like, and you can talk directly to Professor Burma. Um, and please note this uh, event is being recorded and. Uh, but the Q&A part uh, probably will not be included in the uh, transcript we will try to publish uh, in uh, a journal uh, next year. So uh, welcome everybody and we really look forward to uh, hearing um, uh, Professor Burma's talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for that kind and generous introduction. Um, and 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 how delightful it is to be back in conversation um after in actually a decade um a decade in which we have been in touch and exchanging about literature and the humanities and about um post-colonial and world literature critique um what i thought would be a good way of getting the discussion moving is just to show a few slides that pinpoint aspects of my my current writing and research um and in particular focusing on this new project of um of looking at the writing of the far south of the world so what i'm going to do is um it now is to um share my screen and show you a few slides and by Oops, by sharing my screen, I um I lose sight of the group. So bear with me as I um as I just talk talk through. So um in my first two slides, that one and that one, um I'm just showing the covers of um some of the the academic books that um 
that that I have produced across the past gosh um 25 years um just to highlight the idea that has been absolutely central to my work and that the southern imagining um project continues of lateral exchange between different global regions um this idea of cross-border dialogues and of writing across barriers this has been in retrospect if i look back at my uh at at my research this has been uh, a vital theme and something actually that my fiction has also explored this idea of how we speak to each other how we address each other across borders cultural borders linguistic borders um political borders also and of course translation and um Dong Lai Shi is a is a is a is a significant translator. Always great to talk to him about translation. Um, translation is absolutely central to those cross border dialogues. To turn then to the chapter outline of the new book Southern Imagining that I'm currently completing, um, as you'll see here from the chapter array. Um, what I do is I focus here on writing about and from the far south of the world, not the global south, but the far south of the world. This is something that Flair and I can explore in our um, in our conversation, writing from the far south of the world and on the far south of the world. So I begin with reflections on what I call southern light, which is um and another phrase for southern perception um i then talk about mapping how the far south of the world so the southern ocean for example and um and australasia was for many many centuries um unknown to to at least to europe um this idea of there be monsters on the map then I explore indigenous mythologies from Tierra del Fuego and um, Southern Africa and um, South Australia, um, indigenous mythologies of the of the lands and the skies, and I try to to look at dialogic patterns between these mythologies. Um, I then turn to the great Portuguese epic poet who I read in translation, um, Luís de Camões, in chapter three, who wrote um, a poem, The Lusiads, which talks about um, rounding the Cape of Good Hope, rounding Africa to travel to India, there to, to set up a Portuguese trade with south asia he wrote a great poem um a, about um a great epic poem about that journey and about that trade um of course it's a colonial poem but it's also very interesting in the sense that it is a cartographic poem it it tries to imagine what that process of rounding the the cape of good hope through the southern ocean involves I then move on to more perhaps more familiar writing from the from from Britain in English and from America, um, which reflects on the the far, the dangerous, the stormy um south of the of the world. Of course, it's a it's a maritime, it's a maritime region. Um, it is largely oceanic. And um, the British poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the um, the theorist of evolution Charles Darwin, also British, um, the great Herman Melville with his um, with his great tale of whaling, um, Moby Dick, and um, Mary Shelley with her imaginings of um, of regions of snow and ice, the polar regions in Frankenstein, all feature in that chapter. I then move on to the modern period. I look at writing about Antarctica. Of course, it's the uninhabited continent, so um, there are no writings from the continent to to talk about, but there are writings about travel into the continent and the 
discovery of the South Pole. I then look at so-called settler writers, and this may be one of the points of focus in the conversation that we're going to have. Um, I look at Olive Schreiner, a 19th century writer from um, South Africa. I look at Catherine Mansfield and Janet Frame, New Zealand writers. And I look at Australian poets who have tried to imagine and find words for the great desert red interior of, um, of Australia. And then I return, and the book, as you will now see, traces a great sort of half circle, a hemispheric um, kind of arc back to indigenous writing and indigenous mythologies um, from, again, Southern Africa, South Australia, um, and brings us up to the present day. And then finally, I have a, a kind of autobiographical section in which I talk about my travels to these far south places um, and using these travels as a kind of lens for reading the literature um, across the past 10 years. Here are some of the, the key concepts that I'm working with in the book. Um, the idea not of the world upside down, but rather as thought through southern conceptual frames of light, far distance or farness and spin, not so much reactive to the modern as in dialogue with it. And again, towards a, what I want to do with the book is to move, move through these literary readings to um, a more interactive um, world map of literary relationship. Um, and I have there the famous blue marble image of the earth, which was actually pictured um, by Apollo 17 as upside down, but um, the world media that uh, um, reporting on it actually turned the picture um, to turn the picture around so that North was at the top in the way that we usually conventionally understand it. Um, here's a different projection of, um, of our world through the oceans. Um, and um, very interesting, we could talk about that if you like with Antarctica at the very center. And here I also list some of the ideas that I'm, and some of the theorists that I'm working with and in, am in dialogue with in the book. Um, Paul Carter's Road to Botany Bay, um, Epeli Haofa, who is a Pacific Islander, his uh, study, We Are the Ocean, um, and then some linguistic theories also, because I, I centrally talk about translation. Um, and then, um, and I'm moving to my close now, I just give you some examples of, um, of key quotes that I comment on in, in thinking about what it is to travel and to imagine far south. Janet Frame um, with her sort of absolutely crucial question, what did it feel like to be standing at 45 degrees south? And then she says, with comedy, it felt no different. Um, here's the uh, um, New Zealand poet, Bill Manhire talking about yearning for the far south, Antarctica's white flower, while um, uh, being a student in London. Here we have Zoe Wickham, the South African writer, um, sort of orient orienting herself vis-a-vis -vis the constellation, the, the typical um, constellation of the Southern Cross in, um, in the Southern sky. We have Alexis Wright, um, who, is a, um, who, who is an indigenous Australian writer, um, who has woven indigenous mythologies of both stars and desert and ocean into her very great novel, Carpentaria, um, which I recommend to everyone if you don't yet know it. And we end with the southern sky and um, the reminder from one of the characters in, um, in the, the novel that, um, that the world has continued more or less on the same groove since before um, history was written down. The same imaginative groove, I should say. Great, thank you. That was just by way of getting us started and, um, and opening things up a bit. And, to, and, to, and I think to gloss um, for you, um, uh, Dong Lai Shi, um, to just to gloss uh, what the far south is that I'm 
that I'm focused on in this in this big book. Right. Wow. It's the first time I have seen the chapter outline as well, even though I have heard of this new project of yours for um, for, for long. <laughs> um, so it's actually so exciting uh, to hear all these different figures you're dealing with uh, in the different chapters. It's an interesting mixture. Um, so yeah, let's start the <laughs> actual interview part. Um, I'm, sure. I'm loads of questions. Uh, so um, you are known uh, for post-colonial studies, like one of the founding figures and your research on empire uh, and you know in imperialist and anti-imperialist writings uh, are, are very influential. Uh, and this project seems to move to uh, move the key concerns or the keyword to South or the Southern Hemisphere. So what um, mobilized you or what motivated you to have this uh, shift and how do you differentiate that from the global South, which is another very hot buzzword in the theory uh, theories we discuss in, in, in literature, right? And it does remind me of uh, the Far East <laughs> because we are here in what was used, used to be called the Far East, but somehow the term is rendered uh, archaic or too old school, right? Um, it does mm -hmm. carry some Orientalist baggage in, in the, for example, how China uh, was conceptualized in some of the Victorian writings. So when you mention a new term uh, for me, like a far south, um, I wonder how do you conceptualize that uh, as a maybe theoretical anchor point? Uh, yeah. So that's. Thanks. Start. Thanks so much. That's a that's a that's a that's a many layered and a and a really lovely question. Um, just a, a couple ways in. I mean, we could just we could spend all the time that we have just talking about um, that question. But um, just 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 to pull out a a, a few key points. In um, which is why I began with that slide about lateral connection, cross border dialogues, um, a, a, a governing motif that has run right the way through my work has been to try to think about um, about literary interrelationship and cultural interrelationship uh, um, without or alongside or even against the um, the the, me the mediating force of the European metropole. So um, if you remember in Empire, the National, the Postcolonial, um, my 2002 study, I look at dialogues between, um, you know, the Irish William Butler Yeats and um, the Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore, for example. There are many other examples um, in in that book, um, which don't necessarily go through or are kind of radioed via um, the, you know, the literary elites of London, Paris, and later New York. So. So I've continued to 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 meditate on those possibilities, and in this book, um, where it began was in starting to notice how the different um, literary groupings of South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and also actually South America. I've I've taught myself Spanish and I've started to read um, many of the South American writers, in particular Borges, um, Jose Luis Borges um, uh, in, you know, in Spanish from Argentina. Um, I started to notice how they, these writers from these um, kind of very distant from the metropole countries were referring to each other's experiences in order to read their own environments. So um, so that offered for me a key, a central um, example of lateral, rela lateral relationship that doesn't necessarily always go through the metropole, the European imperial metropole. So I try to... Um, I try to 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 work um, or to to find patterns of influence that connect these writers. For example, Olive Schreiner and Catherine Mansfield. Um, I agree, and whenever I've described the project, I'm moving on to your point about Orientalism, uh, I agree that. There are overtones 
to the project, when you look at it as at first glance, that remind one of say Edward Said's Orientalism, that study of how the, you know, how the West imagined and constructed the East as an other. Um, in fact, that falls away to some extent in this project very, very quickly as we move into the, the, the body of the work, because though the frame of the other is one of the frames through which the South is understood. And of course, the, the far, these Southern regions are of course colonized by Europe. Um, so although there is othering pro processes of cultural um, othering that, that go on, at the same time, I try to delve into um, how Southern writers, including indigenous writers, um, and Alexis Wright and Zoe Wickham are at the forefront here, are, are reading back to, um, to Europe or to the, the, the global North. So, um, so there's a, so, so what I'm saying in, in, in brief, um, or in summary is that I'm continuing through this motif of lateral exchange, but I'm also um, you know, well, and I am focused on how these southern spaces have um, have in English and in Spanish and in Afrikaans latterly have um, kind of spoken back to the constructs that have been thrust upon them. Right, right. Well, I see that actually connects to the very classical book uh, Empire Rides Back um, in, you know, uh, published in, in the field many years ago, right? It, it's, there's a continuation, but a lot of um, innovation as well, especially the chapter on Antarctic writing. That is something I think no one has <laughs> seriously worked on before. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, my second question, I guess, um, to become more specific in what we deal with, um, because you're also known uh, in uh, the studies of South African literature, in particular uh, studies on James Kassia, um, and you are also a practitioner of South African literature. So I just wonder, how do you conceptualize uh, South African literature in relation to the South, the, the far South or the Southern Hemisphere? Uh, and what are some of the general features and cultural trends of South African literature you have observed in the past decade? For example, um, mm. as you're writing this book in the 2020s, what has you known the new things that happened that made the project different uh, from if you were doing it like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or during you know the time when Kazia was getting the all the prizes, right? So what has changed? What what new development have come along? Um, mm -hmm. Again, what 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 an interesting question. Um, um I I will start with a with a, a very quick anecdote. When I visited um, Wuhan, the University of Wuhan and, um, and Yangtze University in 2010, I was nominated. I, was, I didn't request the title. I was nominated International Chairman of Kutsi Studies. It was a conference on JM Kutsi that, that uh, invited me to Wuhan. So, um, so, and I'm still very happy to retain the title. As far as I've heard, no one, no one has disputed my holding the title. So, um, but you know that was in jest. Um, in, in you know, seriously, South African literature. You asked about its 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 status and position. Um, South African literature is absolutely central. Is one of the um, national literatures that is central and vital to the book. Um, could see himself being South African born um, and having emigrated to Australia in 2002 and is now recognized um, in, you know, as a kind of half Australian, half South African writer and who has forged um, a major translation project with colleagues, um, you know, writer and academic colleagues um, in Argentina. Kutsi has been one of the, the key writers to my project, the project that I've just been describing, uh, because he has in his own practice and in his um, 
his increasing resistance to the world domination of the English language, um, he, has, he has actually mapped some of the transverse lateral pathways um, of, of writing and exchange that I'm talking about in the book. So, so he remains a, a absolutely, you know, a key influence. He has, in many ways, with his novel Disgrace, defined the post-apartheid um, condition of kind of social breakdown and violence in, in South Africa, but he has also kind of through his own, um, you know, the, the, the routes that he has mapped since 2002, the imaginative, cultural, translation routes, he has actually carved out um, some of the far south um, spaces that I'm, that I'm also exploring in the book. How South African writing has changed. Um, this is a, yeah, this is a difficult question. Um, it, in a way, and this is something we can explore, not, not that much. I mean, South African writing is, was at one point absolutely crucial to understanding the apartheid condition, the uh, condition of state sanctioned um, racism in in South Africa that you know lasted up until 1994 um and this was to the extent that when um Nelson Mandela the first um democratic president of South Africa was released from from um imprisonment political imprisonment one of the books that he requested to read was by Nadine Gordimer the South African one of the South African Nobel prize winners for literature so you know, the South African writing was absolutely, um, absolutely central to to how South Africa understood itself, um, and how and how resistance to apartheid was imagined. Um, uh, so, so that was up until nineteen ninety four. We are now in a in a space. You know, it's it's nearly um, thirty years later. Um, we're now in a space where um, where the the country is um, you know is still unfortunately very very divided along racial and cultural lines, and um, the literature continues to diagnose those divided conditions, but um, but is also how can I say? Um, struggles to 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 imagine differently um so you know the um the novel remarkable very very good novel the promise by damon gelgut which won the booker prize in 2021 is in some ways and could be criticized for still um running along very generic um imaginative metaphorical grooves that you know olive schreiner's writing was exploring you know 150 years ago so so i'll leave it there let let let, let let's let's see how, how how we go with that so so what i'm saying in short is south african literature continues to map uh racially and culturally divided country Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, you mentioned the promise. I think we can focus on that because this is the latest uh, work in South African literature that has become world literature because it was recognized by the booker. Uh, so for the sake of the audience who probably don't know much about it, uh, I will do a brief introduction of the book. So the promise was uh, uh, awarded the 2021 Booker Prize, and it's author Damon Galgut. Uh, it's from South Africa, and uh, he is the third writer from South Africa to win the Booker. And then the previous two were uh, all Nobel Prize winners, uh, Nadine Godimer and J.M. Kassia. J.M. Kassia won twice, um, and Galgut was previously shortlisted twice uh, for the Booker already, uh, first in 2003 for The Good Doctor, and again in 2010 for in a strange room. Uh, I will also just give a very brief uh, summary of the book um, as the, <laughs> it is really relevant to what we're gonna, gonna talk about. 
uh, with regards to the national allegory and all that. So in The Promise, uh, the story begins in 1986 with the death of Rachel, a 40-year-old Jewish mother of three on a small holding outside Pretoria. The drama of the novel turns on a promise that uh, her Africana husband, Mani, uh, made to her before she died, overheard by their youngest daughter, Amor, that Mani would give the, 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 the black maid of the family, Salome, the deeds to the annex she occupies, so that the little house she was living in. Um, now that Rachel is dead, Manny has apparently forgotten and doesn't care to be reminded, nor does his bigoted family, who regards Amor's stubborn insistence that Salome would own her home as the kind of talk that, quote, now appears to have infected the whole country. So again, a lot of the common tropes in South Africa, um, in, also in South African literature, that's being explored in the fiction of Sharina and Godimer and Kazia returns, right, this uh, racial divide and the issue of ownership of land and family drama or family conflict and uh, intergenerational um, reconciliation, etc. Um, um, so it seems to me, you know, uh, the obvious question is like these themes recur in uh, white writing from South Africa and they tend to get recognized by uh, major prices based in the West. So um, and very noticeably, for example, from uh, J.M. Casillas' 1988 novel, uh, Foe, to uh, Gal Galgut's The Promise, right? There's always this voiceless Black character that's very central to the story. But again, he or she is not given the narrative voice from the first person perspective. You know, he's, he or she is always talked about. Uh, so this recurrence is also one of the features um, of this um, consecrated South African writing in the space of word literature. So all in all, with all these observations, the key question or the obvious question for us to ask is, um, why does um, South African literature always um, land, uh, you know, appear to be white in the space of word literature? And as a consequence, how do Black South African literature become word literature? How, how do we see them or why are they Kind of invisibilized in this particular space regulated by the prices right so i think maybe there are a lot of reflections we can have uh, obviously uh, in my own training as well when i started studying post-colonialism in china um it the most of the writers we study from south africa they were white right so it actually took me years <laughs> before i uh, could find like a noticeable um South African writer from a different racial background, like uh, Wickhub, right? Zoe Wickhub, uh, based in the UK. And she offers a much um, more kind of variated um, perspective in some of the stories. Um, so I just wonder, what do you think about uh, this? Yeah, th th this phenomenon. Yes, well, I mean, thank you for a, 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 a masterful summary of the novel and also actually for, for making possible some of the you know the the analytic work that you've that you've asked me to do there um and and maybe i can preface my response by saying that that this is one of the the objectives of my new book project southern imagining to try to read outside those recurring repetitive frames through which world literature from South Africa is is read and constructed, right? I mean, and so what that then leads me on to saying is that um, as you were implying in the terms that you were using, um, there's a way in which prize com international prize committees replicate their own readings, right? So that, you know, they, they've they find what they know, what their education has trained them to see. And this is why Zoe Wickham is actually such a valuable presence in the, in the, if you like, the, the uh, um, and force in the community of, of South African uh, writers internationally, because she, she, she's interested in exploring, you know, other dynamics, including the dynamic of what it is to be um, from an Afrikaans speaking community um and um which he shares with Kutsi actually 
um, and also what it is to try to pass, you know, racially to try to pass as as light skinned or as as white um, when you are, though you are, in fact, from, you know, a, a colored community or a black community. Um, so so she's definitely trying to 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 open up the possibilities of South African writing. But uh, but, you know, it is the case that um, up until 2021, 2023, what is valued in the, inter in the world literary sphere of South African writing has to do with, you know, the farm novel plot, which is a, you know, a kind of um, a, a, an established trope or an established allegory in South African writing, both Afrikaans and in English. Um, and, and, you know, interestingly, and this is why one of the reasons why I really do value the, um, the promise by Damon Galgut is that he, he replicates those tropes of the farm novel of white possession, black dispossession, the silent black servant. I mean, all these are, you know, tried and tested tropes in South African writing. But he does so with a certain amount of humor and self-awareness. Um, I mean, he kind of he kind of sends up the realism. This is something that I've you know written about recently. He sends up the realism from time to time, right the way it's quite postmodern, the, the novel, from time to time across the the I think it's four parts of the of the novel, he 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 pokes fun at his own replication of the of the tried and tested tropes of South African writing. Um, you know, for example, one of the characters, one of the key characters, um, um, you know, is writing and you know reflects on the the book on the day before he dies. He is himself writing. He has a manuscript, a farm novel. You know, he, so he. He is himself writing the novel that he is in. So there's a, you know, so there's a lot of poking fun. There's a lot of jokes about South African realism and what it entails in the book. So I, I do think that Galgut has moved the the South African novel on a stage with the use of humor. Um, he's also, as he said, you know, I'm, I don't know if people in the audience know the, the 1990s, um, British sort of feel-good film Four Weddings and a Funeral. Um, as Galgut has said, he has written a Four Weddings. He's written Four Funerals and No Wedding <laughs> novel for um, for the South African for South African literature. Cool, really interesting. Um... And and so I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt. Really sorry to interrupt. I realize I have not, I have skirted, and I haven't come round directly to your important question about, you know, why are these internationally recognized South African writers accoladed with Booker Prize, Nobel Prize, why are they all white? Um, I mean, this is a this is deserves a very long chapter of discourse. I, but it does have to do with the legacies of apartheid, and it has to do with what um, literary uh, international literary elites recognize as as legible, you know, legible themes or kind of legible codes for understanding South Africa um, in the world literary marketplace. You know, so and you know, one of the codes is farm novel, and another code is, you know, white black racial divides. That actually, black writers may not be that interested in writing about. You know, they may be more interested in writing about, like Zeke Smda, more interested in writing about, um, you know, a, a, a love affair um, uh, between a whale, you know, a, a, a creature of the ocean and a human being, as he does in the Whale Caller, which will be um, a key text in Southern Imagining. That's really great. Well, I'm looking forward to that. I haven't read that particular one yet. Yeah, but it seems to um, offer um, diverse 
um, representation, uh, that's really important. We have more uh, ways of writing uh, South African literature beyond the established tropes, right? Um, but again, to return to the specific question of uh, the voiceless uh, black servant figure, I think this is something really interesting. Uh, as I worked on uh, Jim Kazia's foe before and I read through uh, The Promise, this is um, something worth exploring in, in relation to um, a general issue with regards to um, authenticity or representation um, in world literature. So as you mentioned, you know, in this kind of postmodernist uh, writings, it's very common for authors to have a polyphonic structure or set up some kind of linguistic or um, heteroglossia of consciousness or narrative voices. There are different characters, they, they present themselves uh, through different viewpoints and their stories intersect. But again, in the white writing from South Africa, there is this voicelessness of the black character, the, the central black character that the author or the narrator seems to be hesitant to present, to uh, ventriloquize directly, right? So the way to um, solve this problem of ventriloquism, the colonial ventriloquism, is to have him um, to cut his tongue, like in Foe, uh, in Friday, right, the character, or to have the black female servants not um, speak directly um, as in okay. the promise. So this seems to concern the larger question uh, in kind of race politics that today, you know, um, for example, as we're dominated by the um, established logic of political correctness, <laughs> like uh, in the US media, for example, uh, it's kind of very dangerous or very um, inappropriate rendered as such uh, uh, for a white, white uh, American author, for example, to write in the voice to all, all write a protagonist that is black, uh, right? Mm -hmm. And somehow um, global writing or you know world literature in general has been influenced by this um, hesitant uh, approach or this kind of um, avoidance of so-called transracial writing, right? But I think um, no matter in your scholarship or in your um, creative writing attempts, um, you offer a, a different array of you know um, characters, and some of them have very different backgrounds, and you can enter mm. their worlds very differently. So I still remember one of uh, the very interesting stories in the collection to the volcano, uh, the first story, uh, the child in the photograph, and it's actually mm. about a experience of uh, a, a female student from Botswana, if I guess correctly, even though in the story you don't mention it, but there are some hints, right? Um, so I think it's a very um, touching story and we as international students, you know, um, can identify with it. And this identification is very important. It also shows that, you know, you don't have to write about your own personal experience. That's too extreme, the extreme end of uh, the authenticity um, trap, right? Mm. But also we can empathize with the critique offered by some of the Black authors, for example, when they say, okay, this white author is, you know, trying to appropriate our experience and he's not doing it right. We can also empathize with that. So I just wonder in the great scheme of world literature uh, to do with race, now how do we approach uh, this question of race and representation and authenticity and the narrative voice, etc. Um, yeah, in terms of our academic work and our creative work. Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, so so many interesting pathways. Um, I mean, I completely agree that the anxiety of I think is of course called voice appropriation that really began in. Um, in, uh, in uh, the the United States, um, you know, certain writers like Lionel Shriver have really ignited the debate. Um, it's a very polarized um, uh, discussion. Um, is very can get very heated. Um, it does have to do with racial politics. Of course, it's informed by racial politics in the United States, which in some ways do um, bear analogies with racial politics. In, in South Africa. So, um, you know, I mean, Galgut's defense of the voicelessness of um, Salome, the, the, the black servant in The Promise is has the precisely drawn on, on um, you know, as you say, um, the, the anxiety, um, or he has referenced the anxiety of giving a voice to somebody from another community. Um, but that what that then does is it simply you know hypostatizes it simply replicates 
the you know the silence of the other which is this, this kind of seemingly um inescapable colonial trope so how i've tried in my fiction um to to approach the problem is through strong attempts as in really sort of deeply studied carefully reflected on attempts at um at perspectival shift so so um i will do a lot of research about a particular um a, you know a particular situation that i want to write about i would i would talk to people involved um and when it comes to writing characters in in the past as in my novel bloodlines um which is set um you know 120 years ago at the time of the anglo Boer war in south africa um i you know i will do a, a great deal of reading um uh, engage discussion with historians um try to visit the sites go in this you know experience the the atmosphere of um, the places uh, and the people that I'm writing about, um, and you know, in this, I suppose I I I follow through. I try to anyway. Some of the ethic of someone like Charles Dickens, you know, um, who you know, who necessarily, in order to create drama in his plots, to create drama in your in your in your fiction, you need to create difference. And to create difference, you need to try to see a situation from different angles. So rather than projecting voice upon characters, I try to enter characters' situations from within to, to the best of my ability. And um, and um, you, you remember Dickens, of course, you know, um, there's a, it's a quote from Dickens that T.S. Eliot uses in The Wasteland. He do the police in different voices. You know, he, 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 he ventriloquizes um he ventriloquizes his different characters voices and um ventriloquism is something that i play with also in my in um or I experiment with in my in my novel the shouting in the dark what it is to give voice to a character what it is to give voice to a historical figure um so i d i'm not sure that i ever get it right or that it's possible there is no measure of getting it right but i do try through identification with um, character situations, such as um, the Luanda character in um, in uh, the the child in the photograph, I try to at least sympathetically, not empathetically, but sympathetically enter into the world of the characters that um, that I'm writing about. Very interesting. Um, can you can you clarify a little bit more on this difference between empathetic and sympathetic? Then, I think I mean empathy means you know absolutely feeling with. So to some extent means appropriating the, you know the the perspective or the world view of a character. Whereas sympathy is more of a. You know it 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 recognizes that we that we have different perspectives we occupy you know different vantage points but i'm nonetheless trying to see the world from from where um from your point of view from where you stand i see i see I, I, the, the distinction is important so that we don't occupy mm, the is. subjectivity of the other we just try to give the voice through um, this character and try to deliver the situation so that we can create sympathy um, with the reader as well. Um, so there's another uh, question I want to ask uh, with relate uh, in, in, with regards to South African literature. I think um, it's a question that uh, is related to the recognition of non-Western literature or you know uh, South Southern literature in the space of world literature um, as. Uh, you must know that the, the essay by Frederick Jameson called Third World Literature in the Era of Multinational Capitalism, published in um, 19, 
86, uh, that's almost like 40 years ago, um, but um, <laughs> his assertion that uh, the story of the private individual destiny is always an allegory of the embattled situation of the public third world culture and society, um, it somehow still holds, right, uh, if we think about how the allegorical still dominates how uh, non-Western literature is recognized in the West, you know, and in their way uh, on to becoming world literature. So do you still observe this kind of allegorical domination in uh, South African literature or African literature as a whole? Is this something that we need to overcome um, to individualize uh, the literary in the yeah. South again, or we can actually appropriate the allegorical power to serve uh, to serve us, right? To serve um, whatever the Southern author tries to uh, deliver us through this fiction. And in that way, um, when he mentions, you know, third world culture and society, does the concept of third world still matter um, in relation to your conceptualization of the far south or the, you know, the more popular mm -hmm. kind of debates in the global south? So, yeah, I just wonder what you think about the national allegories in relation to all this. Yeah, um, well, um, it's, it is interesting how that 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 reading of Jameson's, which was so controversial at the time, because what he was doing, of course, was kind of othering an entire field, you know, a global field of writing. I mean, othering as in, you know, seeing it all as sort of, uh, or homogenizing is a better way of putting it, seeing it all as kind of one thing. Um, but you know, he the the reason we keep going back to that um, that essay is is that he was pointing to something that is kind of endemic in the field of of um world letters i mean we we already touched on it when we talked about what becomes legible to prize international prize committees um um uh, and you know and and what becomes what is, remains legible to prize committees is um is novels that seem to capture something typical and communal about a country, right? Um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of, 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 of other examples. I mean, we've already touched on the example of, um, of disgrace, or we, we I mean, sort of mentioned it in passing. This is James Cassie's Booker Prize winning 1999 novel um which which was not representative really of the of the post apartheid condition in the country but kind of replicated a national allegory of so called black peril um you know this idea that the, the, a racially and a, a, a sort of sexually inflected situation that there was a kind of race war which was expressed as sex war between black and white in 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 South Africa now, you know it was interesting that that it was that novel that allegory that resonated because that was legible that was a that was legible to um to to international to readers internationally. So I think what Jamison points to in that in that famous essay is that we do tend to read through frames that we've been educated. To read through, so you know, um, a novel by Zakes Mda about um, a South African tramp or down and out who develops a relationship um, with a whale is just is not. It doesn't fit that pattern through which you know international readers have been taught to read South African literature. So, um, um, you know, what do we do about that? I'm I'm really not sure. It's a, gr a source of great frustration to me as a writer, as a reader, um, that you know you can try out all kinds of different plots, but the ones that resonate internationally are the ones to you know to do with the particular allegory that is associated with your um, with your particular national space. I mean, there's a different set of allegories um, that pertain. Um, in the case of, say, to pick another, um, to, to pick another Southern Hemisphere country, um, Australia, you know, the only 
Nobel Prize winner for literature from Australia to date, Australian born, as opposed to could see who has adopted Australia as his country. The only one is Patrick White and the iconic or the, the you know, the, the national allegory that he particularly used that allowed him to become legible in uh, on the world stage is the allegory of the white explorer going into the desert and and um you know confronting you know archetypal strangeness um and uh, you know and a few indigenous people and losing his life that's you know that that's 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 the national allegory that pertains to 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 white australia and i could go on you know they i mean um it's it's a it's it's an it's an interesting sort of after dinner game to play to to think about you know what are the the novels from the third world global south that have particularly made it that have won prizes on the world stage what are the national allegories that they conform to you know um but actually, in many ways, these these um, these ideas we can flip it. It doesn't need to be projected only onto so-called third world writing or global south writing or far south writing, for that matter. I mean, there is a certain novel about Britain that is legible as national allegory. It's a novel was written by, say, Ian McEwan, for example, um, or you know the the. The um, recently passed, sadly passed away, um, Martin Amos, you know the the nineteen eighties novel of urban decay and 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 um, and friction, um, you know that maybe is a is a is an allegory of uh, modern modern Britain through which those the writers writing those allegories become legible on a world stage. So I'm just trying to kind of globalize your your um your question a little bit to to show that it, it it isn't just something that um that is projected if you like from the us onto the rest of the world right indeed and we are seeing the prices themselves are getting more and more diverse in their taste and in how they regulate the world literature space right uh, so to return to the specific example of the book, um, as we know, you have served as the judge, one of the final judges for the uh, international booker be be before, right, in 2015. And in that year, uh, a Hungarian writer, um, Laz Dilo, uh, actually won the prize. But um, among the finalists, we have uh, Mia Kuto, another very famous white African writing uh, uh, writer, uh, and Amitav Ghosh, uh, a, a very big figure in post-colonial writing. Um, uh, and we have Mar Maris Conde and a lot of um, this uh, so-called post-colonial figures. But um, uh, and the, in, in in the judging panel, we have Marina Warner, <laughs> we have um, Professor Wenqing Ouyang. It's a very diverse panel. So we just I just wonder, uh, can you share with us some of your first-hand experience working with uh, the Booker <laughs> Prize? Uh, you know how they rec how you um, strived to um, recognize particular kinds of writing. Were there any tension in how you decide on the final winner? You know what kind of cate categories or kind of standards um, became more dominant in the final consideration? And again, it's been like eight years uh, since that experience. What Kind of new trends have you observed in mm. in the development of the the, the booker especially the international booker seems to emphasize a lot on the power of translation now right mm. um even though in in your year it, it looked like it's a mixture so translated works and um uh, anglophone writers so do you observe any um di 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 different trends now um that's that, that yes really yes yeah, yeah. There's, there's again there's a lot there's a lot to say in response to that question um and actually i think that something that um, the panel that i was on experienced became transformative for the prize our ours um was the last year in which um we were able to to look at anglophone writers as well as um writers in other languages um, after that point, and it, I think it had to do with um, 
you know, the organizers of the and the managers of the prize saw how we were absolutely, you know, there was we what we did as a panel was to highlight the 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 heterogeneity, the variegation, the 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 diversity of world letters. We just sort of said, you know, we tried to read outside of national allegory, and so much of richness came to the fore. To the point that the that the organizers simply said, you know, we have got to change the parameters of the prize. We've got to make it more. Um, we've got to streamline it more. So if, after the year on which I served, the rules were changed. So um, now writers are only eligible if they have, um, if a work of theirs in translation. So no longer anglophone if a work of theirs in translation has been published in Britain in that year. So, so that is a big change of the rules. Because we pointed out it was just, you know, how do you choose between Laszlo Krasnohorkai, the Hungarian who eventually won, and Maurice Conde from Guadeloupe, you know, with her great corpus of kind of his, historically based fiction um, privileging women's voices. I mean, how do you, you know, how you, you, you need a standard of comparison. So what we, how we resolved this matter of plethora of, of abs myriad of, of, you know, um, vastness was to highlight vastness, you know, to, to, to pick, um, kind of our favorite writers from, a, from a diversity of regions. Southern Africa, Caribbean, um, uh, South Asia, etc. Um, and the beauty was actually in our short list of 10, of which we were very proud. Now you can only have a short list of six. Um, we, we insisted on 10 simply sort of to, to present this array, this great diversity. Um, it was interesting to me that the the writer chosen of those 10 by sort of by a majority decision on the panel was ultimately a writer from Europe, you know, in the, in the European tradition of, of kind of Muzil and, and Joyce and Kafka. Um, so that was legible to most members of the panel. They found that that was more valuable in the end than, you know, um, uh, a writer like Maurice Conde or Mia Kuto. Um, so, you know, we, 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 there was a lot of interesting discussion and going back and forth. So that was interesting. Again, it sort of highlights what is legible. Um, and because, because, um, as I say, yeah, just to, just to recap, because we, we were able to highlight, because our tastes were so diverse, we're able to highlight that it was almost impossible to make a, a decision of one writer only um, as the winner. Um, because of that, they changed the rules. I see the rule change was a major um, was a major factor in how the prize uh, is later conceptualized. I also worked on yeah. that partly because in 2016, um, the winner was Hangang from South Korea and the vegetarian. It actually kick-started her career as a global, again, as a world literature author. Absolutely, um, absolutely. There was, uh, again, this huge attention on Korean literature after that. So the power of the book is indeed um, was only <laughs> was only um, strengthened after that role change. Um, even though the, it is still a restriction that you know uh, they demand the work to be published, the translation to be published in Britain. So it has to be available in the country. So that's the like national restriction we have. But I always felt that um, uh, compared to the US prizes, like we think about the National Book Prize, the Pulitzer, they only recognize American authors. There is even a nationality um, restriction on who they are recognizing. And that's the narrow mindedness of it all that I feel like um, you know, really sets um, the, 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 the book apart from, from the American um, enterprise the, of um, recognition, right? But again, with all these um, prices, um, I want to return to, again, a, a final 
uh, question in, in, in this part um, before we move on to your writing more particularly. Uh, so, you know, as we remember in uh, the, the, the pair of articles written by Franco Moretti in the early 2000s, uh, Conjectures on World Literature and More Conjectures, he actually very daringly said that um, movement from one periphery to another without passing through the center is almost unheard of in world literature. So um, it may have something to do with how he conceptualized world literature space um, using Wallenstein's you know, world system theory. But still, this is something of a dilemma uh, for us based in the global south or based in the you know, non-Western world, right? Like if I want to communicate directly with the African literary world, uh, do I have to necessarily pass through Britain or the US? It's very depressing to think like, okay, I always have to talk through some mediating force in the North first, right? So is it possible, for example, uh, if we establish like a book price in the South and then we can circumvent those um, recognizing uh, forces with all of the, their restrictions? Um, and how do we actually achieve the same level of uh, cultural significance and consecrating power? For, for now, I, I feel like it's almost unimaginable, right, to have an alternative to the Nobel or the Booker. Um, so I wonder in your career, have you observed any um, attempts to do that in all those uh, southern yeah. countries you traveled to? And um, um, how do you evaluate this effort? Is this something worth doing at all? Because according to Moretti, it's impossible, right? Yeah, I mean, I completely disagree with Moretti. And actually also Pascal Casanova, who's the author of the World Republic of Letters, who has who has some, um, she, she uses some interesting uh, metaphors to talk about um, how writers become visible. And, you know, she's, she's, she's seeing the world kind of all exclusively from the vantage point of Paris, the Paris, the Parisian, French, uh, you know, literary world. Um, I mean, these, I, I, I find it a, a supremely kind of overwhelmingly colonizing gesture from both Moretti and Casanova, simply to say that unless it's legible to Europe or America, it's, um, you know, it's, 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 it doesn't count. Um, I mean, what they are recognizing, of course, in their work is, um, is you know, the 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 dominance in the kind of in the infrastructures of um, validation and valuation of um, Europe, America. Um, I mean, as I was saying right at the beginning, it has been my life's work to try to find lateral pathways. Um, of exchange and uh, influence that don't always run via the European metropolis. Um, I, I think that that is proper post-colonial work. Um, it is extremely difficult, though. You know, I mean, that it is because of how, you know, Moretti references Wallerstein, you know, the world is one but uneven. It's a it's a single but uneven world system. Um, and I mean, I, I, I disagree with that um, as a post-colonialist. I disagree with that sort of political economic picture of the world. I think that cultural landscapes, certainly up until this moment of globalization we're in now, were much more clustered and diverse and kind of networked um, in the late 19th century, for example, um, than they are now. Um, but so I think that, you know, we can recognize that there are these differentials, um, but that we can work against them or question them rather than to simply replicate them in our criticism, you know, and say those things, those very unhelpful things that Moretti and Casanova, though so influentially, have said. Um, so, so, so I think what, what is important to do is to do proper archival historical work, you know, to notice how, you know, Mexican artists um, like Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo were referencing, um, you know, Russian formalism and, um, um, 
um, and and also um, modernist art from India in the 1930s. Um, there's some very interesting examples of influence that doesn't run through the capitals of Europe and through New York um, alone um, to look at how, um, you know, um, South African writers on the left, like Alex Laguma in the 1960s, are, um, or Richard Reeve, are kind of consulting with Caribbean writers. Um, you know, those contacts made possible, of course, by the link of the English language that they share, um, but they also thereby pooling their diversity of, of voices, different Englishes that they're using. So um, I think, you know, the, the, the sweeping, um, you know, um, stereotyping judgments of, of, of uh, Moretti and Casanova about 20 years ago have not actually been helpful. I mean, you know, what, what we now have to do is serious, archival work to prove them wrong. Yes, yes, sure. And um, I totally agree with you, obviously. <laughs> but I do think their opinion, especially the um, Franco Moretti, say, um, the sentence from, from him, if we only talk about the institutional and the infrastructure, it, prob it, it is probably true. It just points to how difficult it is to, for, for us to have this kind of um, direct communication mm -hmm. in the global south. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that we should not do it or it's you know not valid to do this attempt. And also from the more cultural list perspective, Definitely, these um, dialogues have always been going on. Especially, we cannot ignore the global sixties, the so-called, um, you know, the during the heightened years of the Cold War, the non-alignment movement, the Afro-Asian writers workshop, the tri-continental movement, the, the, this uh, historical um, uh, events and their uh, sustaining legacies are very important in how we uh, can reconceptualize the literary communications in the global south today. And if we take that kind of culturalist perspective, uh, for example, your work being translated into Chinese and published in China is also um, part of that um, network of uh, communication in the non-Western space, right? Uh, so I yeah. just wonder, um, we can move on to this part uh, uh, about these new publications. Um, I wonder, can you share with us um, how these two particular works of yours uh, got pub um picked up by the Chinese publisher and how it yeah how it um might interest the Chinese reader um as you can imagine the reception in China might be different uh, I just wonder how how do you see um again this the new lives that these works may have uh, once they're translated into Chinese I'm really looking forward to reading them <laughs> yes yeah, so, uh, I mean uh, um and you know sadly because I I I I I, I don't have Chinese. I won't be able to um, to evaluate the 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 translation. I'm going to rely on on you for that. <laughs> um, I I'm very intrigued why it's these two that have been picked up. I I think that there's something. I mean, um, Bloodlines, uh, my 1999 um, novel, is about as I already mentioned, um, the South African War or the Anglo Boer War. It's a historical novel. It shuttles between two frames, the post-apartheid moment, which is a moment of great violence and rupture, and um, this moment of um, of division and uh, and rupture and violence again in um, 1899 um, and 19, to 1902. Um, it, it's, it deals, it, it, it unfolds on a very large international canvas um, I mean, the novel was sparked by finding out that a South African sort of freedom fighter figure was actually the um, the grandchild of the a relationship between Maud Gon's husband. <laughs> so going back a bit, Maud Gon's husband. She's the the muse of W. B. Yeats, the Irish poet. Maud Gon's husband. Uh, had an affair with a black woman in South Africa while fighting in the Irish Brigade on the side of the Boers. This this was the spark for the novel. So I fictionalized that, and I um, and that that 
grandson then appears in the present moment. So I think I'm speculating that the that the shuttling between past and present, um, is kind of you know, a, a love affair um, across racial divides, um, um, that then actually also produces, um, you know, an an interesting dynamic and a sort of suspenseful situation between two women in the in the present. Um, I suspect that it's that broad canvas and that sort of intimate drama and the contrast between that 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 um, will have been intriguing um, to the prospective translators. Nile Baby is completely different. It's something of a young adult theme. It's um, about a, a very close friendship between two preteens, um, two 12 year old kids who um, who discover something of a living history um, in their science lab at school is a kind of ghoulish haunted quality to it. Um, it's set in Britain, actually, though it has to do with race relations. Um, and speaking of perspective, which we were a little while ago, it shuttles between the perspective of these two 12 year old kids. So each it, the, the novel alternates from one chapter to another between their perspectives. Um, it's it's about friendship and about um, discovery um, of you know of history, but also of a kind of understanding, you know, between friends. Um, so again, quite universal themes. Um, I think that that too may have been interesting. It's interesting that both that both novels have to do with um, friendship and reconciliation. Great. These are universal themes. I'm sure they will yeah. appeal to uh, different Chinese audiences. Um, it just amazes me, like listening to the summaries uh, that uh, reminds me when I was reading uh, the, of, uh, the, these novels. Um, also, it really uh, demonstrates the the scope of your imagination, how you can embody these different characters. Some are very young characters, some are very characters with a very different background. So again, uh, we should end on this general question. I, I've always wondered, <laughs> um, it, because at Oxford, I think in the Engli English faculty, you are certainly the most prolific um, writer in both academic and creative writing. So I've always wondered how you managed to do that. And uh, in some of your criticism, you also talk about this reciprocal relationship you wish to yeah. promote between writers and readers, right? Um, even though traditionally we understand the reader as this kind of passive recipient of uh, ideas. So how how do you actually manage to, to do that in both academic writing and creative writing? Um, do you think, because, uh, Mm, in as academics, we tend to think, you know, like we, if we analyze literature too much, we we get stuck in certain ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. It's too analytical. It's not imaginative enough, and we are too influenced by the theories, the critique, the critiques, the different restrictions we have in our minds. So, how do we actually free ourselves from that? Or, or is that actually necessary to 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 do the freeing? Maybe we can um, appropriate those skills and put them into the story to make interesting. For example academic no novels, uh, maybe campus novels like those written by David Lodge or something. <laughs> so uh, how do you view this, um, you know, reconciliation or reciprocal relationship between mm -hmm. different genres, different uh, uh, mm -hmm. roles you occupy? Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it's a it's a difficult question. It's um, it requires a lot of sort of self reflection. But happily, I think I've already started talking about it in some of um, our conversation where I talked about the importance of sympathy, the need for reciprocity and kind of respect um, between, if you like, audience and um, uh, or character and, and writer or, and, and also, of course, reader and writer. Um, it was... How can I put it? It has always been extremely important to me to be clear and that the ideas that I'm trying to, that I'm interested in and trying to communicate do actually come across, you know, so, so um, to write 
vividly, accurately to um, with a sense of where the reader may be coming from is something that is kind of vital to my work, has been vital all the way through. And I think informs my my commitment to continuing to write fiction alongside the criticism and the history. Um, to kind of, uh, to, to understand cultural situations, be they my own or, or, or those of others, um, to understand those situations in as much detail as possible is really, really important. Um, and that includes detail from the past. I mean, I already mentioned the importance for me of doing the research and going into situations in the past that, that are interesting to me. So I, so I, I, I'm always very aware of the reader. Um, and in a way you are, when you're telling a tale from the imagination, you have to be particularly aware of the reader because, um, you need to make sure that you're drawing the reader into the world that you are recreating or, or, or creating from scratch. Um, so, so, I mean, that's, that's addressing the question at a sort of quite a high level of, of, of abstraction. Um, it's relevant also to say that I have become particularly caught up in the last five, seven years or so in um, a kind of um, a revamped, a reinvigorated um, reception aesthetics, you know, something pioneered by a, uh, by a the German critic uh, Isa, Wolfgang Isa, you know, about um, 60, 70 years ago now. Um, has become very important to me because because what that work always um, you know commits us to bear in mind that we're not sort of writing into a void. We are we are we we are writing with an audience in mind. So we're thinking about accommodating the reader. Right. Um, I think that's something very um, interesting to hear because in my reading of some of the postmodern uh, authors, they used to love to emphasize that, oh, I don't think about the reader when I write. I just <laughs> write completely freely. <laughs> I think this is something, some myth that needs to be uh, broken, right? Uh, especially when we take into consideration of all these infrastructural powers we've been talking about, like publication itself is not like operating in a vacuum, basically. Um, anyways, so this is the official end of our um, interview part. So now I will um, open the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, so if you have any questions for Professor uh, Alec Burma, please uh, type in the questions in the chat box, or you can raise your hand, use the raise hand function, and I will uh, pick you up and uh, we can, we can, you can speak directly to, to Professor Burma. Um, and I wonder if Bo Wen or Jun Jun, any of you want to ask a question first. So just to allow time for the other people to to type in their question. Uh, hello, Bo Wen or Jun Jun, are you still here? Yes, I do. Uh, I do have a question. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so thank you, um, Alex, for your wonderful for um, sharing of experience uh, of, of, of reviews on um, a large view a lot a wide range of questions uh, Blair has raised but uh, what a delightful coincidence that we just discussed uh, your work uh, post-colonial um, poetics in the class today this afternoon actually and oh. my students <laughs> has raised a lot of very fascinating questions but one of them uh, I'm also very interested, and uh, um, I just uh, <laughs> take some notes here. Uh, they just mentioned, the students just mentioned that uh, um, the post-colonial poetics, your book um, can kind of brilliantly, you know, um, conceptualize around the issues or the uh, motives or, or kind of, um, you know, the motives of border crossings. Uh, international or uh, transnational travels or uh, kind of uh, movement and uh, the entanglement in road. Um, but uh, it, it has a very important vision of the world or the global vision or planetary vision of the world. But uh, um, it, it seems to me that they're more kind of, you know, because mobility 
today mobility is not it's not equally accessible to everyone, especially in the post-colonial world. So uh, we kind of, you know, wondered um, how they, because, okay, the law class, the view or the vernacular vision of the world is still important, I think, and we think. So uh, the question is, um, we are wondering how, how the post-colonial poetics, as you have uh, um, fascinatingly formulated in the book, can address um, such kind of, you know, the tensions between the local and the global, or the vernacular, or the cosmopolitan. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that is a, the mm -hmm. first question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What a, and, and, thank, um, you. <clears throat> thank you for the, um, thank you for, um, you know, talking about the book with your class. I'm, 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 I'm so pleased to hear that. Um, um because as i was saying to know that there's an audience and as it were have dialogue with and with, with with um with readers is 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 really important to me mm -hmm. I mean, what what i i suppose one of the ideas that informs post colonial poetics is the idea that through our reading we become border crossers you know i mean not through international travel, you know, jet fueled international travel is incredibly damaging for the environment, but actually um, through our reading, we can enter other worlds. We are invited in by the writer and we can enter other worlds. And it's exploring that dynamic of, of how local coincides with global and global relates to local that, um, that the my reading my my poetic um, tries to tries to explore. So, um, I mean, you talked about also the vernacular and the cosmopolitan. Of course, um, language and translation is absolutely vital there, and kind of you know correlating our linguistic and cultural perspectives relative to each other, which which is which is what we do. You know, there's this sort of this dance of approximation between writer and reader and between different readers as they discuss um, a piece of writing together. There's this careful kind of calibration of of cultural difference uh, and a coming together around the 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 narrative or the poem that is being shared and discussed that I'm particularly interested in in. Um, in exploring, in um, not critiquing, I don't think critique comes into this, but in exploring, in in um, in registering, following through, um, as part of post-colonial poetics. So I, I do think that a lot can be done through the activity of reading and talking about our reading in terms of negotiating between the local and the global and the and the vernacular and the cosmopolitan. Yeah, exactly. Um, thank you. And uh, I really like your metaphor of the dance, the dance metaphor you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, but just I, I have to take this chance, take this opportunity, and ask you one more question. Um, that is about reading and writing. Um, also in uh, the post-colonial poetics, you kind of emphasized that reading is an active active activities it's kind of you know it helps to exercise our imaginative and cognitive capabilities in terms of understanding the world or the cultural differences uh, but to what extent writing or creative writing just like what you have been doing can you know kind of serve the same purpose or even the better to do a better job mm -hmm. um yeah it's a 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 really rich question um i mean as, as i was saying in in um in the conversation earlier um writing writing character or you know the sort of the 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 making up of social cultural worlds that you do when you when you when you're writing a fiction um involves an active a, a, 
a a sustained act of deep reading you you know you 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 that's that that act of sympathy that i talked about too you are entering into another world you're not simply sort of dreaming it up you are you are imagining it from what you know from your experience from your own reading so a writer is always already a reader of of character and cultural worlds um and and the reader works together with the writer to compose those worlds um so so it's yeah it's it's reciprocal again between writing and reading yeah, and I have to say that I love, I love your, 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 your connection to, to the volcano. And uh, uh, we, uh, I just reread the child in the photograph and uh, it just, you know, it's more, a very quick question about Lavanda, about is she kind of nurturing a dark secret, not revealing her, you know, identity as a mother or is Nana her daughter or, or her sister? Oh, but that would be, mm. <laughs> that's okay. for the reader, that's for the reader to determine. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'll just, uh, I will have more questions in the chat box. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alex, for you. Right. Wonderful. Um, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I was also <laughs> wondering that, but yes, obviously something that is deliberately designed for the reader to figure out is one of um, the pr brilliant aspects of that particular story. Um, so, I, yeah, before we move on to the uh, the the question in the chat box, uh, Bowen, do you want to ask any questions? <laughs> I'll just reserve some privilege for our friends first. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yes, ask. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for Alec and Flair, such a rich and informative talk today. And I really uh, mm -hmm. enjoy learning so many stuff about the source uh, South African word, South Hemisphere literature, which is something I uh, I previously uh, very near a fear before. Uh, but uh, what I interested most is actually the last question you two have together is about the relationship between your own creative writing uh, and creative writing. And 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 it, my my question actually is uh, not on the reciprocal relationship between them, but actually the difference between them, especially in terms of the narrative voice. Uh, something you even had a workshop yesterday. Um, so uh, if they two have the diff uh, the different, I, I I do believe they have totally different narrative voice. Some, something very critical, and uh, in academic writing you are trying to avoid using the you, the pointing you. Uh, sorry, uh, the um, the I uh, to to mm -hmm. be objective. And in creative writing, and there are so many experiments about the narrative voice, about the perspectives. And also, um, my question on this narrative voice. So, would you mind share some of your own experience of you this narrative voice or your experiments with the uh, point uh, with this narrative voice in your own uh, fictional writing or auto fictional writing? Um, and if mm -hmm. the um, are they take this kind of mediating role as a kind of dialogue across uh, to 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 deal with the cultural, linguistic, and political issue that you have mentioned uh, a lot today? Mm -hmm. Well, then, uh, thank you so much for the question. There's so many ways in. Um, well, one, I, I'll just take one, um, and that is, um, you know, the aversion to the I voice, the first person voice, that still pertains in 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 a lot of um, authoritative critical discourse. You know, it's it's a bit of it's seen as a bit certainly, you know, when we're advising students. It's it's seen as a bit of a kind of um, um, something not to do to use the first person. You know, pe people are much more comfortable to kind of hide behind the screen of the third person. As in, this essay will explore what it means to you no. Know. Um, and you know, as I've as I've kind of matured as a as a writer, as both a writer of literary criticism and commentary and as a creative writer and a writer of history that has seemed to me to be ever more unsatisfactory that kind of masking of the writerly self um so i have 
it, it partly comes out of having written kind of an, an auto fiction in the form of the shouting in the dark, um, in which I did use the screen of the, the third person, but it's kind of clear that there's a negotiation between first and third person, um, you know, throughout that fiction. And I have become much more concerned to, um, because, you know, these lateral exchanges that all my work explores are absolutely important to me. It's, it's become increasingly important to bring the eye in, to bring my, my own voice in, uh, in the, in the criticism and the history too. Um, I think it's, I think that's just more honest. Um, and it, and, and actually avoids some of the problems of, that we were talking about of, um, of appropriation and of claims of authenticity that one cannot sustain because, you know, you're actually saying, look, here, here I am in the text here. I, I'm the right here as the writer. Um, and I'm a P I'm, you know, in, in some sort of communication with you, the reader, this is my position. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to understand other positions. I'm trying to draw you into that process of negotiation, um, between different positions, but this is my position. I, I just think it's, it's much more, it's really hard to do. It's a very, very fine balancing act. We're back to the dance of, appro of approximation that I was referring to a moment ago, but I, I just do think it's much, much more honest. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Alec. And I think we have space for the two questions in the chat box. Um, I've talked to the, uh, the the audience and they they seem to be fine with me just asking, <laughs> reading them out mm -hmm. and asking them uh, in their stead. Uh, so the first question concerns uh, the essentially the figure of uh, our brother Zach Gurner, because Gurner, after winning the Nobel Prize, becomes such a huge figure in China, actually, because this is, again, the consecrating power of the Nobel. And uh, Absolutely. even in the UK, we actually never heard of him, right? I remember in our curriculum, we didn't have him. Uh, either in the curriculum I had in postcolonial studies in China or the curriculum I had at UCL or Oxford, we didn't have him. So even in the UK, um, he was like a surprise, right? And even bigger in China, we never heard of him. Like before the Nobel, um, he his uh, entire collection of um, works, like only two short stories were um, translated into Chinese and they were uh, scattered in obscure volumes <laughs> that no one could find. But after that, like huge national funding had been given to researchers who do uh, African literature just focusing on him. So he's definitely mm -hmm. a, big, uh, a big figure. So the question concerns what you make of him. Also, uh, again, as we were talking about identity politics, like do you view Gurna as a Black British writer or a more of an African writer. So again, I don't know whether you know him personally. He was in the UK for so many years, right? So I just wonder if you, whether you can offer us any insights in terms of his career and how he fits. Well, I have, so, I have so much to say, so much to say <laughs> under that heading. It's a lovely question. Um, first of all, um, we have, you know, the, um, the well-established um, post-colonial world literature seminar at Oxford. Abdul Razak Gurna was twice the guest at the seminar in um, 2014 and 2009. He features oh, on the I website that. that I run called, he, he features on the website that I, uh, um, that I, um, um, that I look after called uh, Writers Make Worlds. Um, and on the day that the Nobel Prize was announced, because no one really knew about his work uh, outside of small select circles, um, you know, our re website was widely cited around the world because we actually featured him. Um, and one of the reasons is, of course, because um, Abdul Razak Gurna has, has, you know, worked as a teacher of literature at the University of Kent, like me, you know, for many, many years. He was a, um, an, an academic critic and also a creative writer. Um, he and I have had a long-standing dialogue precisely about managing that that interesting relationship between those different kind of writerly identities. And, um, and um, for those of you who know his work, there's a character who bears my name in one of his fictions. 
um, one of his prominent fictions. So I think it's Paradise. So so um, so there you go. That's the that's the landscape of connection. Um, Abdul Razak Gurna, I think, I mean, has highlighted in his work the refugee condition that so defines this moment that we're in now. Um, certainly, from the vantage point of Europe, this historical moment, um, and he speaks about being a ref himself a refugee from then, um, you know, um, civil war um, torn um, Zanzibar, um, Tanzania, um, and he speaks about that condition from within, with you know, deeply authentic and um and um um how can i say yeah deeply authentic voice um so i no surprise to me that he drew the attention of the nobel committee um i see him as both a black british writer um who's written about the condition of being a, a you know um, from east africa and living in um you know enoch powell's britain um, but he's also an East African writer, and he sees the world from that point of view, that sort of Indian Ocean point of view, um, you know, a part of the world that has always interestingly been interconnected with China. You know, giraffes were exported from, from um, the East African coast to the court of China in about the, the, the year um, in, the, in the first millennium, at the first millennium, the year 1000. So... You know the, that interesting monsoon governed um interconnected you know um affected by the trade winds blowing across east and west across the indian ocean is something that abdul razak gurna has made his own in his work um, as well as writing about modern britain so um you know, what a great writer um i'm a i'm a big fan that's great to know wow all this Connections really makes me want to go back to the paradise and read it again. Well, I didn't notice this interesting. And I just want to say, well, I, the, the two occasions uh, at the post-colonial seminar, I missed them because I was not there yet. <laughs> no, you <laughs> weren't. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Otherwise, sorry, you weren't there yet. <laughs> right, in the six years I would well, I was at Oxford, I, I missed that important one. But um, I'm sure more uh, writers from the series will win major prizes one day as um, I read so many of those writers. Um, um, so there's a, one final question, I think uh, it's uh, by uh, the Fudan professor Liu Guangzhou. Um, uh, he, he used to study at UCL comparative literature, works on science fiction. Um, his question uh, concerns uh, this mythology in South African or uh, Australian literature. And he was wondering if there is any story about the ocean and seascape in their mythology, and is there any difference between their perception of the sea and that of British culture? So I, I guess in the conceptualization of the Southern Hemisphere, the space of the sea and or the ocean is very different, right? As how we deal with mm -hmm. the pond, the Atlantic, the the Pacific. Uh, I think our imagination of those like oceanic spaces have been very dominated by the northern hemisphere, like uh, mm -hmm. point of view, right? So mm -hmm. I just wonder, yeah, he just wonders. I, I think it, it's a very valid question. Um, how yeah, so it's the, a yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a great question, very very relevant to the book, actually. Um, I mean, yeah, there 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 are probably more answers to this question then we have you know have time to to um think about together but you know, one is of course that british writing because britain is an island and britain has always had a very powerful navy um british writing is in a lot of ways very maritime you know i mean there are maritime motifs that run through um some of the major um you know, 19th century writers, I'm thinking of um, Charles Dickens again and Dombey and Son, um, it was this remarkable image of, um, you know, essentially about, you know, British trade as dominating the world's oceans. Uh, it's quite an imperial image, of course. Um, and then there are those extraordinary images of the Southern Ocean from Coleridge and the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner um, that he, actually obtained from his reading because he never 
was himself um he did travel to Malta on a ship and um he traveled across the North Sea to Germany, but but he he didn't actually have, you know, the mariner's experience. He 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 drew that experience from his reading. Um and of course his, you know, his reading and travel writing, including the writing of James Cook, you know, the the the, the you know Captain Cook of the of the South Seas. Um so so um so Southern writing, so South African writing of the ocean or Australian writing of the ocean or New Zealand writing of the ocean is, is inflected by, by British writing because of those, that colonial legacy. Um, that said, um, it may be interesting to people in this group. Uh, it was certainly a revelation to me when I first started doing the research that the Southern Hemisphere is um, like 89% water, ocean. Um, you know, so so that is why the you know o oceanscapes, seascapes will dominate, will be drawn as a kind of thread, a governing motif right the way through the book. Um, and what is you know, and very noticeable um, is in across the poems and the novels that I have drawn together for the book is this sort of iconic scene of a character standing on a seashore and looking out, not into the into the landscape, like a colonizer, you know, arriving um, for the first time, but rather out to sea out to the southern ocean and um as with the whale caller the in the zakes and Dawn novel I already touched on and kind of trying to find some sort of reciprocity with that great watery environment um so yeah a lot more to say there but i'll leave it there right thank you so much alika for the uh, for agreeing to do this uh, event and uh, it's really great to catch up with you and really looking forward to your um, book on the the fast house and then the two translations um, and we should keep in touch uh, and I will tell you more about um, how the translations work um, I'm sure yes. they're wonderful <laughs> yeah and so I've so enjoyed this conversation thank you for the brilliant questions um, and and it's given me a uh, lots of further um, issues and ideas to explore. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, sorry, I should just 